Hey, everybody. We got a good one for you today. Well, hey, Carolyn, you're in here early. <laughs> you're the first time we've ever had anybody in here early. <laughs> we got a new light, so. <clears throat> Michelle's going to play with our new light. Oh, maybe we need to be highlighted so everybody could see us. How are you doing today? Let me turn this down. All right. We put a poll out earlier this week. Um, probably during the weekend, and asked of four things what everybody was interested in. Right off the bat, one took first place and held it for quite a while, and that was establishing a fruit orchard. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Even though that, that didn't end up as the number one poll, I thought that um, that would be the most interesting subject to talk about since that's the only poll question that got a comment reply. So people were really like interested in uh, establishing orchards at home. As you pop in here, introduce yourself. Now, well, hey, Jennifer, good evening. How are you doing today? <laughs> you know, everybody's starting to look familiar now. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, y'all. All right, so current events what is going on this week well i guess what made the news this week is up in kansas they had a heat wave and mm -hmm. killed a bunch of a bunch of cows mm -hmm. and i was watching a video today about what may have caused that because we actually have hotter temperatures down in florida and we have a lot of cows here and none of the cows here are dying and hey Teresa, and then um they seem to think it's how the cows are treated now, if the cows are fed a fescue or grain, that that generates a higher heat content inside the cow's stomach. Hmm. And they also took into, into consideration that even up in um, Kansas, nighttime temperatures weren't dropping. So the cows couldn't recover and shed that heat during right. the night and uh, get some relief from all the heat stress. And being shoved up in a uh, feedlot and being fed an improper diet mm -hmm. has led to thousands. That's how I feel like sometimes. Especially in South Alabama this week. I'm shoved up in a feedlot and being fed an improper diet. <laughs> <laughs> I do not keep her locked up. <laughs> hey, Joan. That's what doing? I used to feel like. So. Joan is our neighbor. lives just down the street from us, not far. She lives down there by the, uh, by the grocery store. Yep. We're talking about pumpkins today, and uh, she's interested in planting some Seminole, and I told her that we'll have her out. And, right. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll give her some some uh, cherry coffee and pumpkins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring your coffee cup. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have to have her over for morning coffee and a tour through the garden and record it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe well, that's what we do from now on. Everybody that wants to come over, yeah. you get featured on <laughs> get featured on a, uh, a broadcast. <clears throat> So that was in one of the current news. Another current news that I saw today that I, not a lot of people are talking about was uh, re referring back to the baby food shortage. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a Abbott was a baby food manufacturer, the uh, formula. Yes. They form, they make the formula. Well, they were shut down over a lawsuit. Now they're um, pharmaceutical. Abbott is a pharmaceutical. Yes. But mm -hmm. that particular plant, all they did was make mm -hmm. baby formula. Well, that particular plant got shut down over a lawsuit and then there was a big shortage and then the government got involved and they agreed to open back up. Mm -hmm. Well, they've only been open for a couple of weeks and uh, haven't even got a good shipment out to the market yet. And they had torrential rains up there and has flooded the mm -hmm. sewer in the city and the city can't handle it. So they had to shut the plant back down. Wow. I know. Mm -hmm. And I'm still reading about. Um, I agree. Cows should not eat grains at all. Mm -hmm. They should eat grass. Yeah. And if they do eat grains, it's in with a natural diet. Like if they were eating a wheat grass, grazing an open pasture that had grains in it, then I think that would be okay. Mm -hmm. But to lock them up and feed them just grains, their systems aren't designed for that. The cows were not meant to eat solely grains. Peaches in Florida. Peaches in Florida. I like peaches in Florida. I love, Florida peaches. I love that peach tree out there. It's got peaches on it. What is it that the that LA was a Louisiana variety? Feliciana. Feliciana. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we had a Florida variety best and we cut it down and grafted over it. Yeah. 
Well, it blooms after 200 chill hours. Mm -hmm. and so in January, it's in full bloom. Plus, the peaches were never, never did anything for us. Yeah. Well, it's because the freeze would always get them. We'd lose all of our mm -hmm. crops. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you along, Joan. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we've introduced ourselves. We've talked about current events for about five minutes. And uh, Well, what about the flooding? Have you noticed, uh, what is it, um, Yellowstone National Park or whatever? Yeah, they got some big floods oh, out there. it's horrible. And it, it's weird because all across southern part of the United States, uh, they're in a, a tremendous heat wave, mm -hmm. hundreds. Thursday, just regular air and temperature here is supposed to be 104 on mm. Thursday next week wow <laughs> every day next week is supposed to be at least 100. Mm. yeah so that's not even heat index it is time for me to go into hibernation this is the time, <laughs> of, time of the year why i don't go outside mm -hmm. unless i'm doing something in air condition in my garage right so we uh we're getting ready to do a camping trip coming up and we've been out Yay. working on the camper and i've been running the air conditioner mm -hmm. it's the first time i've been in there since i built it over a year ago mm -hmm. yeah all right, we've got some slides. I took some time and uh, built a slideshow. We're going to talk about establishing an orchard, a fruit orchard for your homestead, a uh, small backyard. I have never even counted how many varieties of fruits that we are growing here solely on the basis that we've, we've got grafted plants. Mm -hmm. We've got pear trees that have seven or eight grafts on them, some apples that have multiple grafts on them. So when you start getting into grafting, then you, you really start racking up the varieties really, really quick. So um, <laughs> let's go ahead and get into it. Did um, you read Carolyn's comment? She's got four beech trees here in Florida. I only planted two and the squirrels planted two. <laughs> <laughs> my, my squirrels are lead deficient. I uh, looked up in a, uh, the tree the day before yesterday mm -hmm. and one of them was eating my apple and that... Um, that indicated to me that he is a lead deficiency. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But the cat took care of that. Well, the cat treated him, but then I wasn't able to get to him. All right. So y'all bear with me. First time I've ever uh, put up slides. We're going to go into a slide here. See what this looks like. How's that look, guys? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Bam. Establishing a home fruit orchard with a focus on the Gulf Coast region, Zone 8, since this is the only place I've really ever grown a uh, fruit orchard. Now, I've lived in Maine. I've gardened in Maine. I've lived in Florida, garden there, and uh, North Carolina, Virginia. I've, yeah. I've gardened in quite a few areas, but I've never had a fruit orchard in any of those areas because I did 20 years in the Navy, and I was never going to be in one place very long. I even lived in Oklahoma. I did have a few fruit trees there, but not an extensive, an extensive uh, uh, fruit orchard. Oh, All right. Wow. One of the things you've got to consider when you're going to be planting your uh, your fruit orchard is the zone that you're in. Now I went to the USDA website and I got it right here in the, in the corner, and uh, I put in my zip code, and it brings up a map. And if you were to zoom all the way in on this little dot where we are located, we are actually, downtown Farmington is in zone 8A. And right here where we are, we're on the, the cusp of 8B. Mm -hmm. We're actually in 8B here mm -hmm. where we are. And just a mile down the road is 8A. I thought that was kind of neat. Okay. So you can see right here, it's got a, it tells oh, you how I cold. 8A and 8B. Yeah, it tells you how cold you can expect your winters. And 8A gets down to about uh, 15 degrees, 8B, 15 to 20 degrees. We generally average about uh, 18 degrees, so that's that's pretty far. Mm -hmm. so that's pretty spot on. Carolyn has quite a few fruit trees. Too. Sure does, 18 fruit yeah. trees. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know even how many we have in ground as far as just trees yeah. or just trees in the ground we're about to just explode with that yeah as soon as we get some more property we're about to go no in. that tree that came down oh yeah that big mm -hmm. pear tree that yeah we're gonna bring that orchard this way yeah mm -hmm. looking forward to that it's not in 100 degree weather right <laughs> so when you go to the nursery and if you're not familiar with uh, growing orchard trees it's going to come with a tag. If you look on the back of the tag, it's going to tell you what zone the 
um, that tree grows in. But generally, if you go to a nursery that's local to you, mm -hmm. they're only going to sell fruit trees right. that will grow in your area yeah. anyway. But a lot of people like to mail order fruit trees because right. they read a description. The description sounds wonderful. Yeah. I've done it. <laughs> I had bubble gum plum and I had to have it. Uh, it nothing. Has, it's grown good. It's flowered, but it's never set in one plum mm -hmm. yet. But then we have Shiro, and Shiro loads up. Mm -hmm. We did one graft on a tree, and it loaded up with plums. So we cut down the other plum that we had on that tree mm -hmm. and grafted solely to uh, Shiro. All right. Oh, Jones in 8A. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah, Jones in 8A. That's right. I we're right at, on the cusp of yeah, 8B. And we're in 8B. I looked at it. I, I thought we were, we were right in there somewhere mm -hmm. until I looked in there yesterday and huh. they had us in 8B. Now, this is in Alabama. Um, I went to uh, just Google and typed in chill hours and then our zip code, 36441. And it came up with this chill hour uh, chart. There's one for Auburn. Uh, they got 700 and 40 chill hours this year. Um, last year, the 724, the last day that they measured on was in February 15th. That's, that's about average when it really starts warming up. So you can just do a simple search and get your amount of chill hours. Chill hours are important because when you buy fruits, such as peaches, and it says Florida Best only requires 200 chill hours. After it gets 200 chill hours, it's ready to rock. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you've had your first freeze or not. Right. Speaking from experience here. Mm. Now, if you uh, if you are sold an, a fruit tree, such as Contender, Contender Peach requires 1,050 chill hours. And there was a guy at a nursery in Florida that sold me this peach tree. And it has not grown one inch mm -mm. in the two years it's been in ground. Yep. But the rootstock is shooting up around the edge, so we're going to cut that down completely mm -hmm. and uh, graft onto the rootstock. So that's why chill hours are important. You need to match the fruit tree chill hours to the chill hours where you are. Um, right here is saying that we're getting, we're closest to Bruton on this map, 823 chill hours, which I've always said we get between 750 and 800. So it seems to be pretty accurate. So we try to go with fruit trees mm -hmm. that are fitting that that range, plus or minus a little bit. I'll fudge a little bit on the low side. If it's a 500 chill hour tree, I'll plant it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be taking a risk that it would, when it's blooming, the, there may be one more late frost to get it. Right. But anything that's over 800 chill hours, it's going to be a no-go because once it doesn't get enough chill hours, you are not going to get the flowers on that tree. It's not going to produce fruit. You have to have chill hours for that tree to change over the um, the chemical compounds inside the buds from a, a leaf bud to a flowering bud. And if you don't have that chill hour, that chemical reaction can't take place. Mm -hmm. And then it'll come back out and start growing and it'll never flower for you. So that's the dynamics behind chill hours. A lot <laughs> of people don't know that. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go all into um, this one what that chemical is called I think that's just beyond the scope of what this, uh, what this is all right now if you live in a small area and most of suburbia Carolyn, America Carolyn said you can push the zone can you push the zone oh, we, are gonna talk, we are going to talk about pushing the zone okay I've got a slide for that okay good <laughs> <laughs> and the name all of that right. slide is the zone. Oh, cool. Okay, <laughs> Carolyn. So hold on. Hold, hold on. Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna brief on that. Yeah. Um, when we first moved here, we had 10, uh, just two acres. Mm -hmm. And the, most of our yard is 13, 13 fully mature pecan trees. pecan trees. I wasn't excited about buying property with 13 mature pecan they're, trees. On they're it. beautiful. They, they make for a beautiful shade. They're really it pretty. It keeps it a lot cooler mm -hmm. in our yard because yeah. of those trees. I'm trying not to cut them down. But now I'm wanting to cut some down. I know. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Yeah. So we took the one <laughs> little area on our side yard that mm -hmm. we had, and I'm trying to maximize the amount of fruit that I can grow in that one little spot. Mm -hmm. And we did some grafting. 
The very first tree I bought was a Fuji apple. I ordered some scion wood from uh, from Larry Stevenson. Actually, you got a shell and Smith apple. I did, but mm -hmm. the first tree that I grafted was the Fuji. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I took all my scion and I grafted it onto this tree, about seven of them, put it in the ground, and they started growing. Now, Fuji has not pushed a lot of growth since I put it in the ground, but those scions have been alive. And mm -hmm. uh, hey, Brian, good to have you here tonight. And um, I've been, I was able to harvest some of the scion wood off of those, uh, mm -hmm. those other varieties. Now, I had St. Clair on there. St. Clair fruited last year, and I have to say that was a really dynamic tasting apple. I really like that one. And I want to um, I want to take some scion wood this year and graft that into a tree in itself, mm -hmm. and we're going to put that all on the property that we're looking to buy. So that's how you can conserve space is by grafting multiples onto a tree. And if you can see here, I'll move myself out of the way. That's a uh, that's a tree Mr. Sam Van Aiken created it has 40 fruit. And uh, that's just a, a picture of what it would look like if it was in full bloom. That's not the actual blooms on the tree. An artist did that. That is so beautiful because, honestly, it would look like that if you put different types of, you know, fruit on one tree. Yeah. All the blooms are going it, to, it, it's just gorgeous. And now that being a stone fruit, stone fruits are compatible with each other. You can put peaches and plums and nectarines and um, maybe even some, um, I think somebody's even said you can put almond on, onto a stone fruit rootstock. If it's almond? Al almonds, yeah. Ah. <clears throat> so you can, act, you can really fill up a tree as long as you have a very compatible rootstock. So that's one of the things that you can do is uh, crafting. And we've done that here. We've got okay. multiples grafted onto pears, onto peaches, onto okay. apples. And uh, we are now um, getting ready to expand. So we're going to be grafting onto and putting single trees in, in the ground. Still going to continue to do grafting. I just enjoy the dynamics of grafting. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so this uh, this is kind of an example. Now we have to take the picture down so we can read it. Okay. See you later, guys. <laughs> this is an apple root stock, and you can see the very first one called Bud 9 is pretty common in an apple growing industry. They stake these trees up in apple orchards. Bud 9 is a very um, precocious tree, a uh, very precocious root stock, as it generates a lot of apples, a lot of big apples but a light breeze will float will blow these over so they have to stake and train those up and those only get um i don't know if these are meters off to the side because it doesn't seem like bud nine they only get about 10 or 12 feet tall and you can see all the way up to a seedling which is a full size uh, wild apple or a wild pear or something like that mm -hmm. and so you can kind of pick the root stock according to what size orchard you're looking to grow. Everything that we put in our orchard as far as fruit trees was a semi dwarf. So we expect our, our trees to get up to uh, 12, 15 foot tall. And then that's, that's about as tall as we wanted to get. Now, if we put a seedling out there in the middle of our orchard, it would get up way over everything else and would dominate the space and mm -hmm. would probably end up killing out a lot of our trees. So we try to make sure that our root stocks are all pretty well compatible that one doesn't uh, shade out another. That's right. All right. So next. Now this is uh, an equivalent for pear. And this is going to be the last slide I'll show you on root stock. But you just want to take a look and see um, they've got quince. Over here, you can use a quince tree and graft pears onto quince. And then these are some of the uh, the copyrighted root stocks that they use, even Bartlett seedling and Calariana seedling is what Bradford pear trees drop into the wild. And you see those wild Bradfords coming up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we go bank one out on our neighbor's property and grafting pear, uh, fruiting pear onto Caleriana seedlings out there. So we expect to get a full-size tree um, later down the road that will have be loaded with pears on it. 
pushing the zone. All right, Carolyn. <laughs> this is the slide I told you that we had coming up. We push the zone. It, the picture you see on the left there against the uh, brick wall next to our garage is a poncho avocado. We planted that as soon as we moved here. We actually had bought the tree before we bought the house, and it was in a pot. And uh, I kind of regret putting it there now because <laughs> that tree is going to get really, really big. Yeah. And I thought that I could just keep it under control. Oh. And we're going to try to. But that poncho avocado has several uh, avocados on it this year that it looks like they're going to make. The one on the right um, looks like a crowded jungle. The one in the foreground is my tangerine tree. And the one just behind it there that's also a tall tree is our um, flame grapefruit. And those have been there for a few years. And those are behind our garage. And they are protected from the north wind. So they're on the south side of the building. And uh, they kind of get a little bit protected also from the pecan tree that's right there next to it. So Teresa said north, south, east, west facing? It faces the south, yep. Yeah. Anything on the north side is going to get that cold north wind, and so you are more predisposed to freezing. Now, um, on the opposite side of pushing the zone, I would give my mom a peach tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, Mom, go plant this out in, in your wide open. It needs the chill hours. It's got, to, it's got to get cold. And she just can't understand it. She wants to protect it. And she'll put it right up against her azaleas and try to protect it from any cold weather. And it just doesn't thrive. Mm -hmm. um, ended up dying off. But some trees have to have the chill hours. Apples, they want to be in the wide open. They've got to have the max amount of chill to ensure that they uh, they come out and, and, we're done with and the, uh, slideshow. Um, well, we've got more. Oh, there's more. Yeah, we're only about halfway through this. Oh. So we're going to discuss all this real quick, and mm -hmm. uh, then then we'll put the slideshow away and continue talking. Okay. Now, here's one of my favorite things to talk about: figs. <laughs> I I'm knew a, that was coming. I am on a fig <laughs> kick right now, and uh, you see Brian over there in the chat. Brian feeds my addiction. Uh -huh. Every time I say, Brian, I need a fig tree, he's like, I got you. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're going to be making a trip to go see Brian. Probably. Is that Cajun B? Yeah, that's oh, Cajun hey, B. Hey, Cajun B. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we're uh, we're going to try to get over there to Louisiana, to mm -hmm. Thibodeau, a town called Cacte, mm -hmm. and see Brian this year. And uh, I'm going to see what fig trees he's got. And uh, Make, add to our collection. Add to the collection. Because now we're, we're expanding the pig or orchard. That's yeah. exciting. Brian, so if you've got a, a list <laughs> of what you've got available, <laughs> I would love to see your list. <laughs> and then uh, I'd like to spend some time with you too, for sure. My friend. But um, figs, there are different types of figs. Um, we'll go through some. The only thing that we have here that, in our, that grows in our area is a common fig. But at the very top of the list there, you see capra fig. That produces male pollen. That's only important if you have the fig wasp. And right here where we have, where we live, we get too cold for the fig wasp to live. Yay. The fig wasp is almost the size of a gnat, if not smaller oh, than a gnat. Oh, they're tiny? Yeah, they're very tiny. Okay. And they will, the, um, they will go into the fig. They lose their wings. She'll lay her eggs in there. The eggs will hatch. The wasp will come out the next spring. Mm -hmm. Now, these are overwintered figs that, mm -hmm. that hang on to the bush. The young wasp will come out, and then they'll fly to the, to an, another fig with that male pollen on it mm -hmm. and pollinate. Okay. And once they go in there, then they die because once they go into the, the fig, they lose their wings. That's so sad. Yeah, but that's that's the way God designed it, and it's like that way. It's it's like that on purpose. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. Yeah, there's a reason. So capra figs and fig wasp. Now there's another type called a smearing fig. Um, that requires pollen in order to produce fruit. So we try to stay away from smearing figs here. They just won't do any good for us. Mm -hmm. San Pedro. Um, they also like to be pollinated. And they do two crops, first crop known as the Bariba crop, 
grows on old wood, last year's wood. And uh, Brian hooked me up with DC6, Dead Cat mm -hmm. 6. <laughs> and it was absolutely loaded with breeze yeah, this year. It was. And uh, now, because it wasn't in ground, it wasn't at its um, at peak, what it, what it could be as a good tasting fig because it was in a pot. Now, <clears throat> common figs, common figs is what we grow here in, in our area because any yeah. of those other figs is just basic, basically, um, there's. Yeah, and like Carolyn and Teresa, they, they both have common figs. Brown turkey or Celeste. That's right. That's mm -hmm. what most people have in their backyard, especially if you see a really big, yeah. old, um, mm -hmm fig in someone's backyard in this area and more than likely it's brown turkey that was mm -hmm. the fig to have back then because it weathered well if it rained it was and um, it loads up they grow huge and yeah. just load up with tons of figs they do and they i'm still, not a fan they, it, yeah they're not her favorite we're gonna try and um dehydrate them though this year and i'm gonna see if i like them better dehydrated yeah we got we're on thousands this year yeah <laughs> and plus my grandmother's tree about a mile from here is five mm -hmm. times as big as our biggest tree that we mm -hmm. have in our yard. It's absolutely just ginormous. There's no way you could pick all those figs. You'd probably pick up enough. You'd probably pick five five-gallon bucket pulls off that one tree. It's so cute to see the, the chickens jump up and eat the figs, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, now, there's there's two good resources for figs. Ourfigs.com is a forum. You can get on there and you can talk figs up and down with people. And all those previous conversations they had are still in those databases. And you can get on there and research. You don't even have to ask a question. I guarantee the answer is in there. Mm -hmm. Somebody has already talked about it and they already have they already have the answer posted. And uh, I haven't conversated. Anytime I need to know something, I just go in there. I type my question in, mm -hmm. and I just read the posts that have already been put up. Right. Yeah, any figs right now would be great. Now, the um, another way to feed your fig addiction is go to figbid.com, and people will pay through the nose for that place. Mm -hmm. I've bought cuttings off of there this so year. Be careful. Yeah, if you ever eat a top quality fig, you're going to be addicted, and then you're going to start collecting all these different varieties. Mm -hmm. But figbid.com, you can go there and, and there are some figs that go for almost $1,000 just for a little little plant, just big enough to Yeah, keep but in a pot. if you keep looking and keep looking, you can find the same fig for cheaper. So just some people, it's kind of like eBay. eBay will have a price for something that's, you know, that hundreds of dollars. And then you might find someone that has the same item for less. That, yeah. So. It, the prices always come down if you just hold on. Right. I'd say the average price for a little fig tree on fig bid, you're going to probably looking at uh, $20 for the tree, $20 mm -hmm. to ship it. So right. expect to pay normal and uh, $50 for a tree there on fig bid. All right. Next. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Now, there we talk about the different types of figs. Yeah. I just did a little quick Google search. I'm not even sure who put this up there, but I'm glad they did. Mm -hmm. And I hope they don't get offended that I'm using it. But there are different categories of figs. Um, right here in the top left, these are your Mount Etna types. This is your dark berry figs. This is the ones Michelle likes. Yes. Uh, Rondé Bardo. Um, another tar dark fig yeah, i think those are the, my favorite too yeah <laughs> now, i've heard yeah. some really good well i've had lsu tiger it's a wonderful fig too and i'm going to add that one to my collection okay we'll now see. living that brings up another subject as it being my favorite i mean you could still add it you know, but i don't know if it would be yeah. my favorite yeah it, it's considered right up there it is a really good one any of the lsu varieties are wonderful wonderful trees to have if you see an LSU variety for sale at a nursery, grab it, add it to your orchard, mm -hmm. and uh, you won't regret it. I know that the Atmore Feed Store had LSU Gold in there the other day, and uh, that's another one that I do want to add to the orchard is LSU Gold. Joan said she's second guessing putting the brown turkey in the ground. She said she just got it, and, and it's in a pot. Mm -hmm. Add it, put it in the ground. It's, yeah, they grow still, big. You can still make. Figs they will always it. produce fruit. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, like, I wouldn't give anything that, for that big, big tree preserves. I have in my, ba in my backyard. Yeah. And whenever people want to, there's a lot of times that people want to come over and, and pick a bunch of figs. Now our other, um, other, you know, variety of figs, like the ones that I like and our, our specialty figs, they don't, they're not big yet. They're just sort of just started out. So they don't really load up. So mm -hmm. we can't really invite people to come over and just pick figs because not, not any of yet. those. But they can have, you know, it's nice to have a tree that you can invite family or friends over to pick from because it's not really one that we like, but maybe someone else might like it. So, you know. Yeah. So um, you've got dark sugarberry figs, then you've got light berry figs. Light Where would honey. a brown turkey fall in here? Uh, that would be in the light honey berry probably. Yeah, that one, right, the honey, could, or whatever. They just don't have the robust flavor that, yeah. mm -hmm. that a lot of the other top tier qualities That's have. right. Yeah. When do you like to plant spring or fall? I like I like to plant in the spring because mm -hmm. sometimes it's iffy whether we get that late cold snap and I've got a young plant that's trying to push growth. Mm -hmm. So I do like to put out early spring after the risk of frost and let that thing get as much growth before the mm -hmm. next freeze comes. If I'm losing a tree, it's usually after it starts budding out in the spring and then we get a late freeze. Yeah, that's how And then it busts right. the wood on the tree. All right. So that's, uh, we might have to do an, a special on just figs. <laughs> There's so much to talk about with figs. We'll, but, we'll wait till we have some samples from the garden and everyone can see and we can cut them that. open and let them. Let them see the inside of the figs. Yeah. Well, better yet, let's go out to Brian and do a visit with him. Yeah, there you go. We'll he's do one got out like Brian's. 600 variety in his in his orchard. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Yeah, I love one over there. Now, my other favorite fruit to grow is uh, southern apples. Randall yeah. eats so many figs at Brian's, his lips get all red and swelled up. <laughs> you have to be saying that because that's, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> the southern apple. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and say this right now. We have shell of Alabama, and uh, that's probably one of my favorite apples. Mm -hmm. Even if you go to the supermarket and you buy those really good apples, I really enjoy the flavor, the dynamics of the shell. And you can see here when it was written up, uh, shell was developed right here where we live, in a little town called Appleton, which is just next over um, in the same county that we live in. you got to get a Lady Williams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I figured you would see you keep, keep yeah. on that. I like Granny Smith. So. But um, Mr. Larry, and I put his website here at Facebook, Southern Cultured Orchards and Nurseries. He wrote these up, and these are some of the apples that he sells. And you can contact Mr. Larry, and if he's got it, he'll ship it to you. Um, so this is just a relative sampling of what he has to offer. He is a actually just four and five pages wow. continued on top of this mm -hmm. is what he has. I just took some of the ones that um, that I'm interested in that do well here. This in, is in great Alabama. information though. I'm glad you did it. But he has said that the shell apple is what most complex tasting apple that he grows with a sweet tart and a strange all in one. And I actually mm -hmm. ate two apples at work today. <laughs> and uh, man, they're good. Brogdon was another one that was found here locally, Alabama, Florida border back in 1945. It was found on the side of the road. As wow. A discovery. It's another low chill. And I would like to add Brogdon uh, to this. Sure. Tree. And then a Collie, um, South Mississippi, a Cox Winter, South Mississippi. It's an early apple. So it would probably start getting ripe around this time or maybe in what the, about in the May. dixie red delight it's a large red apple with green stripes good eating apple i've got it grafted oh good yeah i've had it out there on the tree on, that, on that fuji uh -huh. so we can harvest the scion wood and graft that over okay. to a tree on its own uh same with the hawkeye delicious uh hawkeye delicious was the original red delicious mm. uh better tasting it just didn't have that pretty red fruit that right. red delicious is known yeah. for. Horse, North Georgia. Um, Don't apple. we have some horse? We Grafted. do. We, do. Mm -hmm. we have horse on our trees. Mm -hmm. It's a good cooking apple, sour apple. 
Well, I like to just eat a sour apple. I like anything sour. Yeah, that's why she ended up with a uh, Granny Smith in our orchard. Yeah. It's got apples on it this year. Yeah. Yellow Hamilton, it's another roadside apple in, that was found in Hamilton, Alabama. Um, should, be, should have been grown commercially here. Fine flavor, highly productive. Johnson Keeper, it's a big red. In Jackson, Mississippi, St. Clair is probably another one of my favorites. Um, I had that one last year, my tree fruited, and uh, I really like that one. As a matter of fact, he said right here in 2013 at the um, North American Fruit Exchange meeting, they all agreed that it was one of the best ones they had ever had. Wow. Yeah, so St. Clair. Where do we go to that meeting? Oh, I think, Become judges. I, I want to sit and just taste a bunch of apples. I think that's actually held in California. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I, I may be <laughs> wrong on that. Um, King David, that's an Arkansas-type apple. It was discovered in 1893, offspring of the Arkansas black, which is a very ah. popular apple for that area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's said to even be a higher quality apple and disease resistant. So King David would be one to add if you live to a little north of here. Lady Williams is Australia, 1930. It's a seedling of the Granny Smith apple. Wrappings late, at, late at, uh, February is a parent of the, the Pink Lady and said to even be better than the Pink Lady. That's amazing because I think mm -hmm. Pink Lady is a really good apple. Right. Hackworth, Morgan County, Alabama. Bevan's favorite. Um, yellow Red Stripe. Okay. Miss uh, Smith of Mississippi. I had one of those in my orchard this year. I really like the Smith of Mississippi. And I got mine from Just Fruits and Exotics. So you have to go to their website. There's a couple other people have it. But I don't think Larry has Smith of Mississippi. Although he told me that that was one of his favorites. Hmm. So you have to check with him to see if he has that. Um, some pear varieties that Mr. Larry also has is Ayers, Leona, Olton Bassard, and Purdue. These are not apples that you're going to find at your local big box store or your local nursery. These are uh, collector variety apples that, um, that people will collect and grow. And they grow them for great reasons because they're really good apples. Mm -hmm. Now, they may not produce a, a top quality looking apple, or it may be, um, it may burn up during fly, fire blight or something like that. But uh, as far as good flavor fruit, look at some of these old varieties that collectors are collecting, but you won't find a for sale anywhere. Southern Bartlett, Southern King, Southern Queen. They're also really good uh, collector varieties of pears that you don't hear about. Uh, Florida 5845 was one that was generated by the University of Florida, and I don't think it's ever been released. People have termed that as a uh, killer pear, and uh, the people who tasted that at a judging said that it was probably the best pear that he's ever eaten. And uh, there's the source that I got that from, bellhouse.weebly.com, home pear tasting. Um, so you go there. Look. Some of the common southern pears you're going to find that you can go to your big, big pot store and buy are kefir, your pineapple, your orient, uh, which is an Asian variety of a pear, and Florida home. Those are the ones you can generally find in any nursery you go to. Persimmons, Fuyu, Achia, Sejo. Sejo is probably the sweetest persimmon that you'll you'll be able to find. It's pretty common. You're you're probably not going to find very many Sejo at your local nursery. You can always find a Fuyu or a Hachia. Uh, those are pretty common in, in your in your local nurseries. But if you want the best of the best, Sejo, you're going to have to search for that one. And we have it in our orchard. Mm -hmm. This year we grafted and added Nikita's Gift, which is a cross between our little American persimmons and a Japanese khaki. So it's a hybrid. Yeah, I just don't care for persimmons. Randall likes persimmons, but it's just not my. Yeah, I like them a lot. Not my cup of tea. You keep talking about persimmons. You don't have to change it just because of me. 
Well, we're almost we're going oh, okay. 40 minutes. We've got yeah. so much stuff All to right. do tonight. Okay. Uh, pruning your trees when you first put put your trees out, start pruning right away because it will get out of control on you really quick. Um, so these are some of the terms that you'll hear when people are talking about pruning their trees, the terminal bud, central leader, and then uh, water sprouts. They kind of shoot straight up off the, off the branch. You want to keep those trimmed out. Um, any kind of limbs that cross back into the tree, you want to cut out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to open it up to generally open it up to a center so that you get plenty of air movement and plenty of sunshine down in there. Um, unless you're trying to grow a straight up tall tree, then you want to leave that central leader. Yeah, and then keep the suckers off. Keep all them suckers turned uh, cut off. Some root stocks are uh, predisposed and some of them love to sucker. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Joan. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Thank you. All right, other stone fruits such as plums. Uh, along the Gulf Coast, uh, University of Florida just come out with, not just, but recently come out with a series called the Gulf Series. Gulf Beauty, Gulf Ruby, Gulf Blaze, cool. Gulf Rose. And I have seen these at Lowe's and Home Depot and stuff, some of these. So if you live a lot, right at the water or down into Florida, look at some of these plums. So these would not work for us? No, they're a little too uh, okay. low chill for us. Now, we, we've we got the, the little house next door to us has an old chicken saw plum. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's a wonderful plum. It loads mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And my friend Ben White that I went to, went to high school with and graduated with, has a purple plum that his loads down every year. Mm. So this past winter, I went over there and I uh, took some cuttings mm -hmm. and I grafted onto our bubblegum plum. Mm -hmm. So we uh, top worked that over and we're changing that variety over mm -hmm. to something that provides fruit. We got a video coming out on that real soon. Saturday. 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 We did two two pair or two plum graph videos so i don't know which ones will come out first whichever one she decides to work on mm -hmm. so you look forward to that peaches um there are over 300 varieties in the u.s and over a thousand worldwide generally the different categories of peaches that you're going to find are your freestone which when you pull your peach apart that means the flesh comes away from pit that's in the middle mm -hmm. you can just take the oh, pit yummy. right out mm -hmm. and uh, I like freestone and I mm -hmm. specifically sought out freestone just because I don't have to deal with the the uh, flesh mm -hmm. growing to the pit right clean stones are the um, first peaches to be harvested every season yellow and bright red flesh surround the pit and it doesn't the, the meat doesn't pull away from the pit it stays attached very well uh, said to be a sweeter, juicier, and softer than free stones. So clean stones would be desirable if you're looking for a good eating um, peach. Mm -hmm. Semi-clean stone is the best, best of both worlds. Um, so it's a variety that's juicy, sweet as the clean stones with flesh that's much easier to remove from the pit. So that's what we want. So right it's an all-around great peach. Um, it kind of serves two purposes. Mm -hmm. And the nectarines are generally fall right into that category. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, melting flesh. Now, Michelle will say that whenever she eats a peach, she has to <laughs> hold it way out or the juice runs yeah. right down her face. Uh, yeah, that's the, true. That's the melting flesh. You can uh, almost just suck yeah. rather than chew. That's right. So that must be the L.A. Feliciano. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think it is a yeah. melting flesh. Yeah, it's really good. Non-melting flesh is the ones that you find in your stores. That's your good, firm peaches. When you eat them, they kind of crisp, almost like an apple. Um, white flesh is supposed to be one of the sweetest ones. Yellow flesh is supposed to be one of the uh, little more diversity. Well, thank you, Carolyn. I greatly appreciate that. You don't have to do that, but I appreciate it. Um <sighs> Let me put this down so I can see what I got here. Okay. All right. So the best peach for eating whole, choose a classic yellow red skin free stone variety, such as an Alberta, which is uh, usually when you mention peaches, that's what everybody thinks of is like an Alberta type. Other fruits, uh, rabbit eye blueberries and then high bush blueberries. And I've listed some of the, 
um, some of the varieties here in dark, bold. Early season, you have Alapaha or Alapaha, depending on where you're from. Climax, Premier, Titan, Kruer, and Vernon are your early ones. Um, we have most of those. I don't have any mid-season. I wanted to add Pink Lemonade as a mid-season variety, and then a late-season Onslow and Okalaki. But that's if you're going to have a little small orchard and you're going to have just a couple of uh, blueberry trees, they, they need to cross-pollinate for one. But you, um, it's good if they will overlap and then mature at different times so that you don't get your harvest all at one time so that maybe you can uh, expand your harvest over the period of two months. And you can do that with most any of your fruits, any of your apples or peaches, um, you can usually plant so that you can stretch your harvest. You just have to see when it blooms, when the chill hours are, mature dates. Mm -hmm. Usually they have little charts and you can just do a Google search and find a, um, a ripening chart on whatever fruit you're looking to grow. Jujube, we have a jujube in our orchard. Um, when you eat them, and they're like on the uh, right here on the plate, they're crisp like an apple, and they almost taste like a little small crab apple or something. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people will save them until they uh, get dried out like a date, and they'll keep on your counter. You're gonna have to try that. Mm -hmm. They'll keep like this on your counter for up to a year, and then you can eat them like a little chewy date. <clears throat> and that is it for the slideshow, guys. Yay. All right. Whew, I'm hoarse. I wish I had a little water to drink. <laughs> I covered a lot tonight. So we didn't go into great depth on anything I would like to. Okay, uh, baby. Maybe one, one day in the near future, we'll go into great depth and talk a little bit more on figs or a little more on just apples. Show my little water jug. <laughs> Pioneer lady. <laughs> he wanted a little water. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle hauls that jug everywhere she goes. I am. All right, guys, you got any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Anything that was uh, that you have a burning desire to know? We can talk about it now mm -hmm. for a few minutes. We've got a little bit of time. So Carolyn says she's got a few blueberries, which we only have like four or five blueberry bushes. Yeah, um, speaking of blueberries, we have Titan and Kruger, which is supposed to be the largest blueberries. She uses azalea fertilizer on them. She's yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, it's basically the same type of requirements. It requires an, an acidic soil. Mm -hmm. So does azaleas. We need and to step it up, get us some azalea like, fertilizer. Yeah, azalea is like a little sulfur. Blueberries do too. Okay. So um, when I put my holly tone out, that's a good fertilizer oh, for okay. blueberries. I got you. Yep. Um, now we have, uh, I was going to say, I think we have pink lemonade. No, we don't. We, we didn't, have, oh. we talked about it. Yet, okay. But I haven't bought one to put in the ground yet, All right. but we have, um, uh, we have a, mostly rabbit eyes here and we have one Southern high bush, which is fathering and fathering to me tasted better than any of the rabbit eyes that we had. And I think I want to add another Southern high bush variety. Um, just because those blueberry those blueberries tasted really good. Mm -hmm. Now there's another southern high bush variety called Sunshine Blue that only gets about three to four foot tall. We're going to do the entire front of our house in a hedge of those. Right, right so behind our mom's. Some people plant azaleas in front of their house. <laughs> We're going to be planting blueberries as a hedge. Mm -hmm. Oh, Brian's going to start picking figs tomorrow. What are you picking? What do you have right? Just curious, not that I want to come visit you tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be on the road. That's going to, yeah. but we're not going to Louisiana. <laughs> so what can I do this fall to get the ground ready for spring fruit tree planting? Um, if you know what, where you're going to be planting your trees, I would just go ahead and start working amendments in like an organic fertilizer, mm -hmm. Yeah, compost. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, when you get ready to plant your trees, you could just work in a little compost and organic fertilizer into your soil when you plant your trees. Um, the only difference will be that organic fertilizer takes about six weeks to break down before it's available to the tree. So that would be the, the, the advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
improved Celeste variety. Yep, it's time for the Celeste and the uh, brown turkeys to start turning right. Uh -huh. About another week or so, our brown turkeys will start turning right. Right. And usually the very last of June, we get our we get to pick our first one. Yeah, I'm excited. Keep looking at my trees out there. So which should she do with the rabbit eye? Cynthia was asking. You were talking about the rabbit eye. Yeah, you could go ahead and start building up your soil now if you if you know where you're going to put your rabbit eye blueberries. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and work that in. But rabbit eye does as far as growing. Rabbit eyes do great in our area, more so than the southern high bush. The southern high bush is lower chill. It's really be does better down in Florida. Mm -hmm. Southern high bush is a, is a mix between um, the blueberries that grow naturally in the wild down in Florida and the high bush that grow a little north of here that do better up there that taste a little bit better. So they bred them, crossed them, and come up with southern high bush. So but um Joan was asking wondering what she might could plant under a canopy. Oh, blueberries. Blueberries, paw paw. That's another one I didn't mention. Yes. Go into an orchard. I have been wanting some paw paws because they're really good to juice. They're supposed to taste like bananas. And there was a period of time whenever I was really into juicing. But it takes a lot of kale, it takes a lot of carrots and lemons. And so until we get some of those items growing back, you know, a lot of um, I'm just going to hold off. But I want to do the pawpaw. So we we planted some pawpaws. I'm looking forward to that, getting some fruit off of that and juicing it. Cynthia puts lemons in her water jug. That's really good because mm -hmm. uh, lemon in your water helps your body absorb the water. Right. There's a few things that we didn't cover tonight as far as orchard. We didn't go into the grapes or the blackberries or raspberries or stuff like that. Our pawpaws are really small, but uh, they're, they're chugging right along. Yeah, they're a Kentucky <laughs> variety that was given to me by Mr. Carl down in Pace. Yeah. So um, they're they're a good variety of pawpaw. I mean, we have them as an understory kind of on the, the outer edge of mm -hmm. one of our pecan trees. Mm -hmm. So they get a good amount of sunlight, but then they're protected from the midday sun. And then they get some fall mm -hmm. sun or the evening sun as the sun goes down. Muscadines. Yeah, muscadines. We're going to be expanding our mus muscadine orchard. Mm -hmm. I wrote to um, on Facebook over to Isons, which is a breeder of muscadines, and told them that my sweet Jenny just doesn't produce a lot of muscadines. And mm -hmm. I wanted to see what a recommendation was for a bronze muscadine. And he said, Pam. Okay. Pam Musk, uh, Scuppernong is a good uh, bronze variety that loads mm -hmm. up. So we'll probably look at getting the Pam variety. And I want some seedless grapes. Yeah, we're going to be adding some, some more seedless grapes. All right, guys. Well, we've been on here an hour. So Has it been a, almost mm -hmm. an hour? Yes, we need to get ginger and turmeric. Uh, turmeric. Yep. It was on my list to get planted and some garlic. I want some black garlic. Yeah, we mm -hmm. can we can do that. We can order some. And there's blue turmeric. Yeah. I want blue turmeric. Baker Creek has blue turmeric and it was so expensive. Okay. We'll see about getting some of it. Put it on your fig list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. We're excited about a blueberry hedge, but I'm going to German schmear the house first. So we have to wait until the fall. I'm not going to German schmear the house in this heat. And um, the spring sort of snuck up on us a little fast. So I didn't have time to German schmear it just yet. But in the fall, we're going to German schmear the house. And then by the spring, we will plant blueberry hedges. Lowe's carries sunshine, blueberry, and a little one gallon containers so the plants are about this tall we already planted one out well, just to this, test it to see and it survived it's mm -hmm. been in the ground a whole year and it was loaded with blueberries yeah. this year mm -hmm. so now that it's going to do good here but uh once the heat start attacking lows will put those plants on clearance <laughs> and i have seen them on clearance for a dollar a container and, and we're going randall to need, just scoop we're, them up we're going to need about 20 of them yeah 
yeah. I'd rather pay a dollar a container than twelve dollars. Sure, a yeah, for sure. So I'll be keeping my eye on those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they don't go on clearance, then uh, we'll fork out the money and get them. Yeah, Carolyn's like, what spring? It only lasted like a week. I know. Yeah. It went, it like. yeah, like a winter and then a week of spring and then boom, it was hot. Yeah, it's time for me to go into summer hibernation. Yeah. This is when I come inside and start soaking up air condition. And then I try and get him to do some inside jobs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I want one brush. I almost bought one today. Um, we have to uh, get ready to go camping. Yeah. Gotta load up the camper tonight. Got a lot of stuff to do, guys. All right. Well, I enjoyed hanging out, and hopefully, you got something from the content. Don't forget to hit the like button, and uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate you guys joining us. And we'll see you next week. Thanks it is hot. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.